I also, I just heard a dog scratching at the door. I don't know if you want to meet the dog, if the dog's yes. the podcast or not. I'll go see if the dog's still there. Okay. Yay. Oh, there's two of them. Baby, this black one here, she's our full-time pup. We got her as a foster like a year ago. And then Tess, who just hopped down, she's our current foster. So she's going to get adopted soon, but she's really sweet. We're going to miss her. Welcome to today's episode of Invested Success. Today, our guest is Jesse from The Best Interest. Today, Jesse and I talk about all kinds of things, including our favorite tech stack for productivity. I share all of my secrets on how to keep social media from consuming you. And we also talk about what it's like to foster dogs. Obviously, we talk about the best way to budget and invest your money. And Jesse shares his secret story about how he's going to propose to his girlfriend in a few weeks. She doesn't know yet, so don't tell her. And let's hope she doesn't subscribe to the show. But it's a really fun story. I would love to hear in the comments below if you think his proposal plan is a good one or not. Before we get started, as promised, I am going to read a review of the week. So let's see what Gentle Rain 117 has to say. Elise is the hilarious whip smart brave voice you need in your life the psychology and brain hacks covered in this are so fascinating listen listening to this podcast has been life-changing and the host has a way of articulating finance and productivity topics and breaking them down so they are approachable and easy to understand thank you so much that's so meaningful i really appreciate that review what do you think of the show drop a review on itunes and i might read it live on air and you might win a one hundred dollar gift card before we get started please remember to smash that like button and hit that subscribe button wherever you happen to be listening i really appreciate it and without further ado please help me welcome jesse from the best interest welcome jesse so i'd love to hear like about the beginning of your financial journey but then also how you came to be an influencer in the space sure so the beginning of my financial journey the the beginning, at least, that I think most listeners will care, will care about. We can go back to like age 12 if you really want to. But the part that most people will care about is that I came out of college at age 22 with student debt and a pretty good job and no idea what to do with my first paycheck. And, and that's a problem that many, many people have heard or many people have gone through themselves or many people are going to hear more of in the coming years. Or maybe some of your listeners are going to go through it themselves in the coming years. And yeah, so I, I found myself at work surrounded by coworkers who were in some of the same scenarios as me saying, I'm in student debt. I've got a car loan. I'm renting, but might want to buy a house soon. I want to spend money on all the fun things that I missed out on as a teenager or just that I didn't have money for as a teenager, really. You know, like I, I want to be able to spend 500 bucks on a kayak. I couldn't do it as a teenager. I want to do it now. But can I do it now? And then there's this thing called retirement that I should be preparing for, right? So you've got 20 really important questions and no answers, at least no answers that I'd already been taught in either college or, or high school. Thankfully, a lot of those answers do exist out there on the internet already. There are tons of people producing amazing content out there. But I just thought to myself, well, my friends enjoy listening to my answers because I was one of those people in my friend group where I would go off and find answers to the questions that we'd been talking about. And then I'd you know, email or text everybody after the fact and say, hey, like I found this article, I found this link, or here's a write-up of what I found. Over time, those emails and that writing turned into my blog, which is called The Best Interest. Uh, the blog turned into a podcast and turned into some social media accounts. And now it's a, it's a little financial education business where I, I write for some local financial planners and advisors because I've gotten some, some traction in the local financial advising community through some of my investing writing. And yeah, just things are growing. I'm reaching people and helping people and, and it's a lot of fun. So I'm going to keep doing it as long as it's fun and fruitful. And that's how it's been so far. By day, my nine to five, I'm an engineer. So I'm a mechanical engineer by training. I work for a company that builds uh, satellite telescopes, which is pretty cool. We put stuff into space. So it's a pretty technical job. And some of that definitely helps when it comes to understanding investing understanding some of these complicated subjects and breaking those subjects down into some sort of learning that any person can understand it helps being able to say well let me try to explain to you how a satellite telescope works you know if, if i can do that to someone in a minute or two and get them just the basics 
that kind of skill set helps by saying, well, let me tell you how a stock works, what a stock represents, what it means when you own a stock, what you can expect from stock ownership. So there's some definite parallels there. That's so true. It's so key to be able to explain complex principles right. so and distill them down. What are your earliest memories of like having an idea of what you wanted to be when you grow up? Well, it's funny. It's a great segue, a great natural segue, because we can go back to that 12-year-old story if you want to talk about entrepreneurship. So I, I do have this funny story of, of being uh, 11 or 12 and my my middle brother, I'm the youngest of three, my middle brother was playing in a, a baseball league. I wanted to buy a video game, a computer game. It's called Age of Empires 2. Some of your listeners will be very familiar with it because it ended up being somewhat of a legendary game. I really wanted a copy and I didn't have money for it. But I convinced my dad to loan me some money, which is the way that many businesses start. He loaned me like 50 bucks. I took that 50 bucks and I bought bottled water and canned soda and some candy bars and some snacks and bought some ice, threw it in a cooler and went to my brother's baseball game. And every week I'd come back to his baseball games with new ice, but the same food from the last week that I didn't sell. And over the course of the summer, made, you know, 150 bucks profit enough to buy this game and enough to make me realize like, well, I can start a little business, make a little income. Working for money is fun. Having money to buy things is enjoyable. So that was one of my earliest stints into entrepreneurship. But the question was, you know, when did I first really know what career path I wanted to go down? From an engineering point of view, I was a member of a science Olympiad team in high school. I, I don't know if it's a national, I think it's a national competition, but for those who aren't familiar, a group of high school kids get together on a team. There's something like 20 events spanning chemistry and biology and math and physics and engineering and earth science. Kids participate in different events as a team. You try to do as well as you can in each individual event. You get scored as a team. And if you do well, you move on to the state competition, yada, yada. I really liked the engineering events. And that's when I kind of knew, okay, I think I'm going to want to go to college, be an engineer. I enjoy math and physics. I like building stuff. So that's how I got started on the engineering track. Both my parents were teachers. And so in college, I ended up being a teacher's assistant, TAing a ton of different engineering courses and found that I love teaching too. So I think some of that love for teaching is definitely what's pushed me into this personal finance space. Because really when I'm working with someone, when I'm answering a question, when I'm doing something one-on-one -on -one or in front of a group, it reminds me of being a teacher, of helping people understand, of helping people improve their lives through education. That's so inspiring. I'm so on board with you. I wish I had known how cool engineering was earlier. Cause I like, if I could go back in time and major in anything, it would probably be engineering or computer mm -hmm. programming. So if you had been an engineer, would it have been like something software, computer engineering related? Probably. Yeah. I'm a computer nerd all the way. I think if I had an understanding of programming sooner, the things that I could have done. My strengths also do tend to lie in creative media and writing. So I do wonder, it probably wouldn't have been the easiest thing for me, my brain, but I think it would have been really just fun and interesting and exciting. A lot of people don't know how interesting engineering can be. We'll see what the future brings. Cause right now, I mean, there are more and more of these little coding schools popping up where, you know, they'll essentially, you can go to school for free or near free in return for giving them a share of your income when you become a paid uh, programmer. And, and we'll just see how that progresses in, in coming years, because I could see some of that curriculum almost losing the strings that are attached to it already and say like, yeah, we'll give you an introductory coding course for free, literally for free. And that might open the door for, for people like you who want to give it a shot, see what it's all about. I don't know. I think it, all I'm saying is don't be surprised if, if that ends up happening in the next, you know, five to 10 years. Yeah. I love talking about that. So I've worked kind of in the tech space for a long time. You and I both have day jobs outside of this hobby. So I am very curious about the future of work and the obsolescence of college, which might be a controversial thing to say. I'm sure that it, it will have its place, but with the rise of online learning the way it is, I, I know that a lot of employers tend to prefer a four-year degree for programming, but I, I just really love the idea of online learning and the way that it makes the workforce more equitable, potentially. It's funny. I've talked about this before. I'm not sure where, actually. I don't think it was on my podcast, but you could, for example, you can take, I think it's every single MIT course online right now for free. I believe Ooh. they're all, the thing that you can't get is the MIT degree for free. 
but there is going to be some sort of crossroads that we're going to come to, or maybe that we already have come to, but I think in the next few years, we'll come to it where people are going to say, okay, why am I spending $300,000 on this degree if I can get all the same education for free or near to free? And, and it's going, something's going to have to meet in the middle where the price of college is going to come down. Fewer people are going to go to college. Colleges, especially small colleges, we're already seeing small colleges basically get consolidated, for lack of a better term. In some cases, can be sad. You've got these like beautiful, famous schools that only have, say, 2,000 students. Well, they're, they're closing because as soon as 2,000 turns to 1,800, they've lost so much revenue and they can't stay open anymore. Long story short, I'm very interested in that, in that future, too. That's a cool topic. Did you see the Netflix documentary about the famous scandal with college admissions where people were paying off. I thought that that was interesting and actually a testament to why college actually might stay around for a while, because sometimes people are paying for, you know, the connections and like kind of the intangible and humans tend to enjoy having that kind of like elite secret private club that, that only people can pay to get into. So I'm really kind of curious how that will evolve as like online learning becomes prevalent and accessible. Yeah, that, that is a great point. I mean, I, when I think back on my college experience, I would say I don't have any regrets. I thought the, the learning was terrific. I made so many friends. I made so many lifelong connections. So for me, it was totally worth it. But I can see other people who would say it wasn't worth it or I wouldn't want to do it. Or at the end of the day, it was just a piece of paper that allowed me to get into my job. Once I was in my job, then I was able to really start what I needed to be doing. But yeah, to each their own. But I, I would not be surprised if maybe we're at peak college right now. Or, you know, we hit peak college at some point in the past 10 years or maybe in the next five years. And after that point, we're going to see a decline of some sort. Absolutely. I think the thing about college is it's kind of like an invisible benefit sometimes to the people who have it. Like it's really easy to write it off and say, oh, you know, I spent a lot of money in four years and what did I really get out of it? But at the same time, I have had a successful career based on my degree that I know other people without that privilege and benefit don't haven't pursued simply because they didn't have like the confidence of the degree. I think it's tricky. It's kind of like how sometimes like living in a safe society, I'm like, why do we need the government? But then like, it's like the water you're swimming mean in that creates that sort of safety. Right. Well, there's a famous quote by Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, right, who recently passed away. But she, in one of her writings, I think it was for a case actually that she was the dissenting opinion. So I think it was in one of her dissents where she compared the, the law that they were changing to being in a rainstorm, holding an umbrella over your head and deciding to close the umbrella because you weren't getting wet which is, a, it's a similar analogy there, right? Because, you know, the umbrella is the thing that's doing the protecting. It's the reason why you're not wet. So you can't say that you're going to close the umbrella because you're not getting wet and you'll be okay. As soon as you close the umbrella, the rain will pour down upon you. And, and I agree. I think there are a lot of people, especially, you know, on, I, I'm on Twitter and, and I see people on Twitter who are dunking on college and being like, oh, college was such a waste of time. It was terrible. It was a waste of money, waste of time. I learned more in three months on Twitter than I learned in four years on college in college. And I say maybe, and for some of those people, it's probably true. But I think for a lot of those people, if they closed the umbrella and had never gone to college in the first place, their opinion might be different. That is so well put. Nice quote. Excellent sparring. I really dig it. That was that. Yeah, cool. I love that you have that quote off the top of your head. It's a really good one. Describes perfectly. She said it better than me. Trust me. She, she, what she wrote was better than what I said, but I think I got the spirit of it. Correct. You're quoting her was better than what I was trying to describe. So I'll take it. I love that. That's so cool. Yeah. Talk about Twitter. It's been my job to work on Twitter for 10 years. And nice. how do you manage like the rocky waters of social media as a financial influencer? And like, how have you found success in that space? It can be tough. And the reason why is because on the one hand, there are a million opinions, which is okay. There's nothing wrong with having a million different opinions. Some of the opinions can be subjectively worth discussing, which is good. It's good. To, you know, if, if I go out there and I say A and someone else responds and says, no, not A, I think we can talk about that. You know, there are people out there who know way more than me about niche subjects that I enjoy interacting with. Some of the downside of it is 
I've begun to realize over time, and it didn't really take too long to start realizing that certain things sell a lot better than certain other things. And in some cases, the truth, what I would consider the truth, or what I would consider legitimate good advice is nowhere near as sexy as something else that sells much, much better. What ends up becoming popular, what ends up going viral, what ends up getting retweeted or reposted or reshared, it's not always the best advice. And I don't mean that to say that it's something that I um, just happen to disagree with. There's, it's fine. There are plenty of things I disagree with that happen to be popular. Well, I'm talking about stuff that is like you could ask a hundred financial professionals, do you think this is good advice? And they would say like, absolutely not. No, that is not good advice. And yet it ends up being popular for a short time on, on say Twitter. So that's kind of what I found. So there's a good and a bad of social media. You, you can reach people, you can share your message with people who you never would have been able to, or, or people who are looking for real advice can come on to what we call money Twitter and learn from not only me, but you know, a hundred, a thousand people who know more than me and who are more educated than me. That part is awesome. But the double-edged sword is because anybody can access this medium, you get people who are grifters, people who are intentionally trying to sell bad advice, people who are trying to scam other people out of money. I think it can be a challenge for someone new to the space, someone who just doesn't know what's going on. How is that person supposed to delineate between the genuine broker who's offering great advice for free or the genuine broker who's offering great advice for, for a fee, for a fair fee versus some complete scam artist? Because some of the scam artists are popular. So if, you, if you're going just off of a popularity contest, it's hard to tell who's who and, and who's good and who's bad. That's why um, specifically with this podcast, I try to bring people on who maybe are not necessarily well-known or in the spotlight as much. And also I think for me, I don't know, I've, I've found certain ways of figuring out if someone is a scam artist or not. It's not a foolproof, perfect way. I'm also very sales resistant and paranoid, but what are your ways of kind of differentiating between somebody who's legit versus not in the space? I've got a, a decent answer, a semi-decent answer. One time I ended up writing a blog post about it where I, I kind of asked myself that question. How do you tell an honest broker or how do you tell the truth from a lie? And, and one of the best ways you can do it is to, to ask for proof. And what do I mean by that? How, how do you ask for proof? Well, one of the easiest ways to do it is to ask for social proof. But unfortunately, as I just alluded to a few minutes ago, that doesn't always work because social proof usually means popularity and popularity isn't always indicative of, of true, honest, good advice. So a lot of times the way it's going to work, at least for me, I would advise someone to try to read from different sources. And do they all happen to, you know, do they relatively, do they get along? Do the sources mesh with one another? Are they saying similar things? Okay, that's usually a good sign that the person that you're interested in is trying to be an honest broker. You can see who they're interacting with and you can kind of start to build this, this network in your mind of what's the circle of influence that this person is running with. Does that seem legitimate? You can look at their actual body of work, which is one thing that I enjoy doing. And I can ask myself, so, you know, I, I come across a new influencer on Twitter and I say, let me try to read their book. Let me try to read their blog. Let me try to look at everything they've ever written. And, you know, are they telling things that I think are genuine? Are they selling products? You know, and what I mean by that is sometimes there's a correlation between people pushing something that happens to be not truthful and also selling something that happens to be ridiculously expensive. And that to me is usually a red alarm that, that something fishy is going on here. It's not necessarily easy to find a truthful, honest broker in this, in this space, but usually give yourself time, try to collect some data on this person. And by, by that, I mean is look, look for their proof, look for their evidence of what they're saying. And are other people corroborating what they're saying? Are other people agreeing with them? And do those other people seem reasonable? Is that the same kind of stuff you would see, say, on a reputable blog or the Wall Street Journal or Bloomberg or those kind of things? And over time, you'll start to realize who tend to be the, 
the honest brokers and who some of the dishonest ones are. Absolutely. Such great advice. To be honest, I suppose that's one of the reasons I was really attracted to the FIRE movement because Mm -hmm. they really didn't have a lot to gain financially for giving investment advice. They seem like a pretty genuinely motivated group who just are very excited about this stuff and, and aren't trying to necessarily sell anything, which is kind of cool. Not that trying to sell something is bad per se. And if they are, it seems like servant leadership focused, which is always really cool. I like that when I, I look for that when I look for financial influencers. I like that term. I'm not sure I actually heard it before. Servant leadership focused, but that I think I know what that means. And at least I like the way it sounds. Yeah. It's like how I try to be a manager or, Mm -hmm. you know, if as an influencer, I try to ask my audience what they need and deliver that as if I'm their servant, because the way I see it is you can be employed where you have one boss and you are their servant for lack of a better word, or you can kind of like crowdsource many bosses that are customers of an e-commerce store readers. They are technically in a way your manager, your boss. So you want to deliver for them. Right. Excellent. Yeah. I I like that too. And I think we we did touch on something there, at least that is important, which is like, you can sell something and, and that's totally fine. There's nothing wrong with selling things. You know, we're in the business of money. And at least in this country, the business of money is based on capitalism. And capitalism, although some people hate on it, has many, many good things about it, which is that it pushes people to innovate. It pushes people to create new useful things because other people want to pay them for it, right? So there are plenty of people in the space, including myself, who have found ways to make money from our work of spreading this information. For me, it happens to be I I write for local financial advisors. I write for local financial planners. They are professionals and they pay me for my services. My blog and my podcast are free with some little advertising here and there. And for people who really want it, I do have some one-on-one clients where I charge them a relatively small fee for one-on-one financial coaching. Why do I charge them a fee? Well, because I found that the free clients oftentimes ignore the advice and tend to come back for the same advice over and over again. Not that there's anything wrong with that, But as soon as I say, yes, I would love to sit down with you for an hour, it's going to be 50 or 75 or 100 bucks. All of a sudden, you have a bit of skin in the game and you want to commit to improving and getting better. And so it's better for me because you're focused and you're going to come back every however often we meet and have improvements to talk about. And we're going to be able to work together. And it's better for you because you're going to improve and things are going to get better. So there are plenty of ways to make money without grifting people. That is something to be careful of when you meet influencers in this space is, are they grifting me? Am I actually benefiting from this money I'm spending? So as somebody that does give professional advice, what are some of the most common issues that you see with clients financially? The biggest problems I see can be solved with some of the first steps that you would push someone on in their financial journey. And by that, I mean, okay, one of the most common problems I see dealing with a relatively young person in their 20s who was in a position a lot like the position I described at the beginning of this podcast, where they're a relatively recent college grad. They have a a job, a good job, but they have a bunch of different debts and a bunch of different hopes and dreams. And they say, where do I get the money to fund all these things? How should I prioritize all these different things? How do I also do that while investing? So it's really about kind of that prioritization. One of the first things I push people towards is, well, if you don't know how much money you have to put into all these different priority buckets, we need to start a budget. So, you know, budgeting is one of those personal finance 101 things, but a lot of people, they don't know how to budget or they're not sure how to get started to them. Budgeting is kind of some strange combination of like a chore that you don't like combined with a spreadsheet that you're not comfortable with combined with looking at your bank account, which makes you anxious. And so budgeting is, is not a happy thought, but okay, we can work through it because budgeting to me, now that I'm kind of on the other side of some of those problems, budgeting is freedom. I love my budget. It's, it's a great thing we, we can talk about that. So that's one of the big things I, I work with clients on is, is budgeting and, and how to take your money and, and put it to good use in your 20s. A second one that I'll just touch on real quick is how to begin your investing journey. Your 20s are the best time to start investing, if not your teens. Not many of us get a chance to start investing in in our teens, but the earlier you can start, the better. So what are the smart things that a 20-something-year-old can do to 
start their investment journey. Once you've been on this journey for a year, if you're listening to this podcast and, and you've been paying attention to personal finance for more than a year, you're going to look at me and say, Jesse, that is simple stuff. Investing like first steps of investing, that is simple stuff. I, I know, except if you've never done it before, then it's not so simple. And those are the people that I'm looking to help help along the way. So those are a couple of real simple ones, just budgeting 101, investing 101, what to do with your money, what some, some simple tips and tricks are that are going to make you feel better about your money over the long run. Such good advice. I love that. I like the whole budgeting is freedom concept, but I would always just set really low budget goals and then sweat every single penny. I hear there's other people who do it differently where you budget for something and you feel okay about spending. I'm mm -hmm. curious how one would go about that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there, there are a bunch of different ways to budget. Uh, one of my early articles that I still is a fond article I, I hold in my memory I asked a bunch of other bloggers and I said, hey, can you guys just tell me how you budget? And then I'm going to kind of categorize you and, and figure out, you know, does everybody do it this way? Does everybody do it that way? What, what do these smart money people do? It turned out I was way out on one end of the spectrum. And so I'll, I'll start out on my end of the spectrum. I use this app called YNAB. You need a budget, Y-N-A-B. And I budget every single dollar that I earn goes into one of my buckets in the budget. And then every single dollar that I spend, even if it's 99 cents on a pack of gum, gets entered into my budget. And so I've got earnings and I've got spending and I track every penny every month. My goal is to track everything. And I've been doing that faithfully since November of 2018. It's been three or four years, every penny. Now, that is a bit extreme. Like I said, I'm way out on one end of the spectrum. What a lot of other people do especially once they've been budgeting for a few months or a year or two, and they've gotten comfortable with what their usual spending habits are, what they'll start doing is they'll start checking their bank account maybe once or twice a month. So they'll maybe check on the 15th and they'll check on the first of every month. And so over time, they'll start to see these trends of, you know, every time I check in, my bank account is up between three and $500. Let's say that that's the trend that they see. Well, all of a sudden, if one month their bank account's down 1500 they're going to go, wait, what, what happened there? Why is the trend different? What changed? Oh, that's what it was. It was the car broke down and we, we just had to spend the money on that. And, and that explains it. But they'll, they'll see these trends over time. They'll know about what they spend. And if something crazy happens in, the, in a two-week period, they might pump the brakes and ask themselves, okay, I need, I need to go back and check on that. So to each their own, that, that's probably on the light end of detail. I say anything lighter than that, Anything lighter than checking once or twice a month probably isn't checking often enough, in my opinion. Because really, if you're just checking once a month, we're talking about two minutes of effort. You're going to check your bank account once a month, put in two minutes of effort, and then, and then log that compared to the last month. That's, that's fine. That's nothing. Right? It's saying it's no effort, but, but it's good enough for, for an experienced person. When I'm working with a newer person to money, I would tell them, I know it kind of stinks. It, it's going to be a bit of a hassle for you but I would err towards the side of more detail early on so that you can look at yourself after a month or two and say, okay, I spent $300 a month on groceries. I also happen to spend $300 a month on dining out. That's the kind of level of detail where they can then make a value judgment after, after knowing that and say, are you happy with that level of spending on groceries and dining out? Some people are, some people won't be. But those are the, that's the level of detail you need to then reflect and say, these are the categories that I want to cut mercilessly. That's a Ramit Sethi quote, right? Ramit Sethi, I will teach you to be rich, spend lavishly on the things you love and cut mercilessly on the things you don't. That's a budgeting exercise. First, you need to figure out what you're spending your money on in a detailed way. And then you can start to cut mercilessly on the things that you don't care that much about and continue to spend lavishly on the things that you like. I actually mm -hmm. have to credit him for probably a lot of the success I have today, except it was like that advice that kept me eating out at restaurants for a long time. And if I had known about the fire movement, I think I would have reached fire a little bit sooner. <laughs> but what is the stuff that you cut like mercilessly and spend lavishly on? If I had to really think about it. So my girlfriend loves dining out, going out, kind of, you know, exploring new restaurants and stuff like that. And I, I enjoy it too. I'm not saying I don't enjoy it. I think she just enjoys it more, but we do. I mean, we, we spend a good amount of money on dining out, but here's one thing that I would push people towards at least over time 
if, if they're interested, one thing that we've really enjoyed is rather than say dining out twice a week at, you know, that nice burger and fries place down the road. Instead, we'll kind of save up those twice a week money, if you will, and save it up for maybe twice a month where we'll go out to a, a nice place in the city or, or a new place that happens to be a little more expensive. So all, it, all I'm saying is that, you know, we're, we're still saving up some of our money to spend lavishly on a couple nice things instead of a bunch of medium things. So we, we enjoy dining out. I'm a fairly active outdoors person, so I don't hesitate to spend money on like hiking gear, camping gear, a new pair of boots, those kind of things. I buy a fair amount of books. I think there's a there's a name. Is it Iki, Ikigai? I-K-I-G-A-I? I'm not sure. I might be getting my Japanese terms wrong. Ikigai, oh, so I think. Iki, Ikigai. One who collects books, even if they're not planning on reading them. What are some of your favorite books? What are some of your favorite reads? Well, I had to Google it real quick. I am definitely wrong. It's Sundoku. Sundoku is the practice of collecting books even if you probably won't ever read them. <laughs> so I'm, I'm working on that. But thankfully, I, I buy used books and they're relatively cheap. But some of my favorite books that I've read recently are just favorite books in general. So from a money point of view, I really enjoyed A Random Walk Down Wall Street by Burton Mulkeel. It's fairly technical. It's fairly mathy. But if you consider yourself someone who is very interested in investing, and you kind of want to know some of the backstories behind investing, the backstories behind index funds and, and why this whole, you know, you can't beat the market movement has started, you know, pushing people towards index funds, highly recommend a random walk down Wall Street. Second one that I really enjoy is uh, a Boglehead's Guide to Investing. Great book by, by three of the Bogleheads. The Psychology of Money is one that like in the last 12 months has become kind of like the book du jour. Everybody's reading The Psychology of Money by, by Morgan Housel. It's, in my opinion, it's pretty well deserved, right? Morgan's a great writer. He's a great storyteller. And the book is full of interesting stories about essentially about people's money mindset. So it, it doesn't necessarily tell you how to budget. It's not a book that's going to tell you how to start a 401k or how to invest your money, but it's going to tell you these stories about other people and their experiences with money. And it's going to make you think, oh, how, how can I take that story, take that experience and pour it into my own life and my own experiences? And I, I think that's a wonderful thing to be, to do a wonder, wonderful way to think about other people's experiences and, and, how they can benefit you. So those would be three three easy money books that I would recommend to people. Oh, very cool. I'd love to hear a little bit more about like a walk down Wall Street. What would be your favorite takeaway from that book? That's a really good one. One quote from that book that I really enjoy that I've used on my blog before and is probably going to be in a blog post in the near future is, quote, if we knew a stock would go up tomorrow, then it would just go up today. It's a very eye-opening quote when it comes to how assets are priced and, and this risk reward portion of assets and how, you know, we price things based on a, a probability curve. We're not really sure if it's going to go up or down, but we have these probabilities where we think it'll end up and the price gets set based on what people think about that. Are people expecting things to go up? Are people expecting things to go down? So a really quick example is, you know, let's, let's take that Quote from Burton Mulkeel right at face value. If Ford is trading for $100 today, and then I came to you, Elise, and I said, listen, I am positive that Ford is going to trade for $110 tomorrow. It's $100 today. It's going to be $110 tomorrow. Well, the question is, would you buy at $100 today? You probably would. Would you buy at $101 today? You probably would. You would buy at any price under $110 today because you knew for sure it would be at 110 tomorrow and you could sell for a profit. So if the market knew that, if all these market participants knew that, they would start buying the stock at 100. And then, okay, we've got demand at 100. What happens when you have demand at 100? Well, the price responds and the price goes to 101. Well, you're still going to have demand at 101. The price is going to respond. It's going to go to 102. The price responds to the demand and the price would find its way to 110 today even though I had said it's going to be at 110 tomorrow. So what does that mean for us? Really, it just means tomorrow is unsure. And as soon as someone says that tomorrow is guaranteed, you have to ask yourself, if you have guaranteed a certain price tomorrow, why isn't it that price today? 
if you have guaranteed a certain price next year, why isn't it that price today? So those are the kind of questions that go into market psychology, the way markets work, the way market is really a, the market's a voting system for what people think the price will be in the future. If the market was sure about something, and if something was a guarantee and 100% of market participants agreed on a certain opinion, we would see that reflected in the price right now. So I, I just think that's a really cool idea. It's a really eye-opening idea that many people, including myself, don't understand until they sit down and start thinking about the way markets work. That's fascinating. I love that quote. I've never thought about it like that before, but that's one of my favorite things about money is the psychology and the human behavior behind it. I find the most fascinating part for sure. Have you found from any of those three books, like actionable stuff that you've been able to put into your own life? Yes. So I I would say that my personal investment strategy is heavily, heavily based on the lazy portfolios that were discussed. I'm, I'm fairly certain they were discussed in both A Random Walk Down Wall Street and in The Bogleheads Guide to Investing. I know for sure they're in Bogleheads Guide, but I, I want to say Burton Mulkeel mentioned them too. But either way, a lazy portfolio, it's a portfolio of index funds. I, I think probably most of your listeners know, know what index funds are. Happy to explain them if not. You know, the standard index fund only holds stocks. Say a, a lot of people are familiar with these total market U.S. index funds that hold all U.S. stocks. Well, a lazy portfolio goes one step further and says, yeah, it's nice to be diversified within the stock market, but I also want to be diversified in some other asset classes too. So maybe 50% of my portfolio is going to be the U.S. stock index fund, and 30% is going to be the international stock index fund, so I get some international exposure. And the remaining 20% is going to be, let's say, 10% bonds and 10% REITs or, you know, commodities, whatever you want. But it's, they're all index funds. So they're all very diverse funds in and of themselves. They're all very low cost funds because they're index funds. And, and that's the way index funds work. They're passive, so they're low cost. But I'm getting exposure across a few different asset classes because I want that diversity. I don't necessarily want to be 100% exposed to the whims of the U.S. stock market. So I learned that from those books and implemented it into my own investing. And to this day, my portfolio is a, a lazy portfolio. That's a good tip. So I, w- I got into that as well. I'll never be able to pronounce the name of this stock, but it's the combo of like the Asian markets as well as like Australia, New Zealand, and a couple of others. But I bought a bunch of that when I heard about that concept of not being invested 100% into the U.S. stock market. I got it from mm. Quit Like a Millionaire. I can pull up my portfolio and we can nerd out about it, but okay. I really like that. <laughs> what are you on? Are you on the financial independence journey? Or are you on the retire early journey? A little bit of both. A little bit of both. I, I will say I do not have a fire date in mind. I don't even really have a fire number in mind. So in that way, I'm not by any means a traditional fire person. However, I've written about fire a little bit. I've had people on my podcast who are fired or are planning on firing. I love paying attention to the fire subreddits. And what I tell people is that I'm saving like a fire person. You know, my personal savings rate is in that 40 to 50% range, which depending on what track life takes me on, I probably could fire at say 40 to 45 years old. Well, as soon as I have two or three kids, that changes things. You know, so right right now I don't have any kids, but hoping to be married soon, relatively soon. Kids might be on the way. And, and I'm kind of waiting until that point to really decide what my fire future looks like. Very cool. So it sounds like you enjoy your job and you enjoy doing what you love. I certainly enjoy working for others. It might be that servant leadership that you were talking about, Elise, where I, you know, the idea, for example, this, the blog and the podcast, I love doing that. The financial coaching that I do, I love doing that. So I could see myself doing that for a really long time. And okay, that might not put me at a retired early point, but it is the kind of thing where I, I could at some point say I retire from full time work and just do these little things on the side that I love and continue doing. But I think maybe what you were hinting at is right. I'm not necessarily looking to end my career at 45. Some people do. I think that's really cool. But I'm, I'm, I got things that I want to try to do and might keep me working later than that. 
I think that's great. I love that. That's something I've wanted to explore more on the podcast because obviously we have a lot of entrepreneurs and fire people, but I think that a, a long-term rewarding career is, is equally an equally noble goal. And if you found something you love, there's nothing wrong with having a job. And I think that's like a problem in some of entrepreneurial culture because there's great jobs out there with great teams and it's very possible to be happy in your full-time job. So Right. Not everybody can find the job that lights their passion the same way that their hobbies light their passion. That That is hard to do. Uh, in some cases, people have been sold that it's possible when in, in reality, maybe it's not. Un unfortunately, you know, if your passion is the New York Yankees, you might have a hard time finding a job that allows you to, to live out your passion, right? You might have to move to the Bronx and convince someone to hire you to work in the Yankees front office. You know what I mean? They're, like there's a limited number of jobs compared to the number of Yankees fans. That, that's kind of what I'm saying, right? It, it might not work in that case. Not every rabid Yankees fan is going to get a Yankees job. However, a dear friend, he's a wonderful guy. He's 78 years old. And up until a few months ago, he was still working. And I think he would still be working if, if he had his druthers. I think he basically got laid off because of COVID. He was still working uh, at an engineering firm in business development essentially, you know, finding new clients, trying to find new partnerships to work with. And, and what did that job entail for him? Well, it entailed taking people out to breakfast, meeting new people, going to networking events, playing in charity golf tournaments, saying yes when he got invited to go meet someone at Starbucks. It's just he's a very social guy. And his job was essentially socializing with people, trying to see if they'd be interested in doing business with his firm. And he loved it. And he loved it. And I think he would still be doing it until the day he died if he had his choice. So I look at him and I say, OK, there is someone who matched up something he really enjoys doing with work. And to him, he would work forever, even though he could have probably retired 25 years ago. So that's my idea of if I found something like that, something that made me feel the way he feels about his job, I could see myself doing it long past fire age. Oh, that's a great story. I love that so much. And, you know, there's a lot you could dig into with that because the funny thing, statistically speaking about health is retirement actually equals certain death. So there's a lot of issues with the fire movement in that respect. Obviously I'm on board with it, but a lot of people who I think there's a disconnect in what people understand as this movement. And it might've been like misnamed a little bit because people seem to be like, oh, I'm going to retire, but really they mean, I'm just going to like quit my job and focus on my passion projects type of thing. So that's something to definitely figure out. Right. You probably know these stats much more well than I do. On average, early retirees die sooner than their normal retirement age counterparts. Now, didn't see the study, but it's an interesting it's an interesting statement. I can believe it to some extent of people potentially losing some of their forward momentum in life when they retire. And and yeah, it, it does make me think, what would I do if I retired early? I would probably continue doing some of the things I'm doing now anyway, because I really enjoy doing them. Small personal anecdote. My my dad teacher, as I mentioned earlier, he retired at normal age, 50, 58, 59 when he retired. He always was an avid gardener, but he's now turned probably two and a half to three acres of my childhood property into more gardens. When you think about how big two and a half or three acres are, it's it's fairly decent size. And it's basically a full time job from, say, April to October. And then the winter is spent planting seedlings in his greenhouse inside, you know, that kind of stuff. So like he has kept himself very busy. He loves doing it. But I just I look at him and I say, like, yeah, he, he's not sitting around watching Judge Judy reruns. That's not his retirement. In some ways, he still is working. It's just on something that he loves to do. And I think for most retirees probably would do that. But but some might get caught in a trap of I've lost my momentum in life. I've lost some of my purpose. I've lost some of my socialization that I used to have at work. I could see someone kind of losing that momentum and the point where the brain starts to affect the body. And yeah, you, you don't want to be unhealthy in retirement because you don't have anything to do. Oh, that is so well articulated. And yeah, that's what I, the issue I have is I think some 
of the older generations equate retiring with kind of sit or, sitting around and doing absolutely nothing. Right. And then there's a lot of people I know who could retire, but they say, what would I do with my time? And I think that's actually a problem. Like if you don't know what you would do with your time, if you have a full-time job, then maybe it's a good idea to do this kind of stuff that we're doing now and explore what some of those passions are. So, because someday retirement will come. So hopefully you have a whole exciting line of hobbies ready to go so that you don't become one of those mortality statistics. Right. I agree completely. Nice. All right, cool. I'm going to ask you some like more hard hitting questions. Are you ready? Okay. Yeah, All right. Yes, what is an apparent failure that later set you up for success or a time that you failed, but it, it turned out to be an okay thing? I've got a, a pretty good one. I think my first job out of grad school. So, so my real quick, my path was undergrad worked for 15 months back to grad school. And then I got a job out of grad school. And at the time, it was a job where one of the leading engineers at the company was one of my best friends. So it's a very small company, like 15 person company with three people in the office, 12 people out on the manufacturing floor. Two of the three people in the office were the husband and wife owners and founders. The third person was my best friend from college. And he was like, hey, we kind of need a fourth person to be doing uh, some stuff similar to me. Do you want to come work for us? And I was like, this sounds really cool. It was a playground company right? Playgrounds. Really cool. Fun. Fun to design playgrounds. And I kind of went in saying, I'm going to go design playgrounds and I'm going to like do some really cool stuff with playground design. I've got a ton of ideas. And through some of my own fault of not really doing enough research or not asking the right questions in the interview, that kind of thing, I realized they didn't really need an engineer. They needed a part-time salesman and a part-time secretary is what I would say. They needed someone to kind of handle some of the office work and, and they didn't want to redesign any playgrounds. They didn't want to design any new playgrounds. They just wanted to make sales on the, the playground designs that they had already cemented and, and that were good, that were perfectly good. So I don't blame them for that. But I spent, you know, six, six or eight months there. Before, and, you know, by the end of that six or eight months, I was just like, what am I doing here? This was, this was like a complete, you know, from a career point of view, a, cre a complete waste of time. However, in retrospect, I learned a ton of valuable lessons from that failure about, you know, making sure you're on the same page with your future boss and asking the right questions about what you would be doing, uh, making sure that the right opportunities for growth are there. I got kind of lucky in that I was able to go back to one of my grad school professors and say, hey, I really like your course. You seem to like me as a student. Do you still know people that you used to work with at the telescope company? And he did. And that's how I ended up with my current job. But that playground company job, from a career point of view, if I'm looking at it selfishly, that was a failure. However, I learned a lot. And, and looking back on it, it was, a, it was a stepping stone. Maybe not the stepping stone I would have wanted, but an important one nonetheless on my journey. Oh, that's a great story. I'm glad that it all worked out well. And I completely relate. I got into this habit of just leaping into any and every job I could get because it was so, mm -hmm. it was so scarce. And yeah. Yeah. There are, there are a lot of potentially toxic work environments and it's important to remember in an interview, you're also interviewing them as much as they're interviewing you. It's a very classic and common mistake. I think I've definitely made. And fortunately, the good thing about it is I kind of look at it as dating, right? It's kind of weird that there's this history resume thing that you have to build where you never have a gap in it, or you're never at a company for a couple of months or you're considered a flight risk because you know, I dated a lot of people and we went on a first date and it wasn't right. And that's fine. Luckily, I didn't have to show my husband like my marriage resume of all the gaps and relationships I had, because I think that's how it is. If it's not a fit, that's fine. And, and everyone should be able to walk away. No, no hard feelings. Definitely. And for what it's worth, correlation between good interviews and good inter employees, it's close to zero. Just so all the listeners out there know that it's not a negative correlation. But it's also not really a positive correlation or it's just like a slightly positive correlation because, yeah, I mean, there are plenty of people who are smooth talkers and great interviewers and, and very personable and, and can show up on a podcast and make a great impression. That doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to be the right fit for the next five years. And that's just one of those longstanding things in HR departments that, like we talked about earlier, the way that universities might be revolutionized or 
the coding industry might be revolutionized. Don't be surprised to see HR drastically changing their practices in the coming years as we get more and more data about the lack of correlation between interviewing and employee performance. So I feel really passionate about neurodiversity in the workforce. Just as much as I'm passionate about all kinds of diversity, I think it makes your company really a lot stronger if you've got a diverse workforce instead of a bunch of like, yes, people, monoculture who all think the same way, because then you'll be able to recognize blind spots. For example, Michael Burry, the gentleman who predicted the 2008 recession has Asperger's. He didn't know it at the time, but his son was diagnosed and he discovered through his son's diagnosis that he also had it. So he was able to spot the, the recession. He profited greatly. I think his net worth is like 300 million or something like that. And if we had had more Michael Burry's in the workforce, maybe there would have been people with different perspectives who could have spotted those potential anomalies, you know? But that also applies to like ADD, social anxiety, introversion, all of which are correlated often with high intelligence, creative thinking, empathy, intuition, et cetera. Right. There's something to be said there. I mean, even in my own job, there are certain jobs within the company that get selected for based on personality. And, you know, especially when it comes to management and on upper level management, you start to see, okay, it's the personal people. It's the people who get along with everybody else. You start to see what traits end up getting selected for in that process. And meanwhile, you know, as an engineer, sometimes I look out at the crowd and I say like, do you guys realize who the smartest people in the room are? It's those guys over there who don't necessarily have the best personalities, but they're the ones who are saying all the smartest, most correct things. And it's up to, you know, if I had my druthers, like everybody should be listening to them, not listening to the smooth talker at the front of the room. He's just a smooth talker. I and maybe some of my coworkers can see through that and see that there's nothing of substance behind that facade. I think it's the same thing that you're that you're talking about, Elise, where there are people out there who don't interview well or they don't necessarily present well on a daily basis at work. But if you actually start to listen to the content of what they're saying or you give them enough time to really let the cream rise to the top. I mean, that's what you start to see is there, there are people out there who the cream rising to the top is amazing if you just give it enough time. And there are other people who within the first 15 seconds, you'd be like, oh, he's a cream at the top guy. Look at, look at how good that is. But then if you give them time, you start to see this particulate settle out and you're like, ooh, what, what, what is that? So time heals all things in that scenario, I think. I absolutely love that. That's why I'm, why I'm excited to have like a treasure like you on the podcast. Cause to oh. me, I can tell you're a diamond in not in the rough even though, but you're very charismatic and intelligent. So oh, thank you. I appreciate that. Even if you said I was cubic zirconia, I would take, <laughs> looks like a diamond, but no, you're, you're the real kind. thing. You're the real thank diamond you. for sure. Yeah. Fair much. trade diamond. We'll say. I appreciate that. Maybe even lab grown. Did you know they're lab grown diamonds now? I have that. I wish I was wearing my wedding ring so I could be like, check out my lab diamond. I don't know when this is coming out, but I'm going to have to keep the, the, but the fact that I know about diamonds, I'm going to have to keep that on the down low for now from, from my girlfriend downstairs. Really? But Can you like, please, t I know we just like just met, but can you please tell me what you're going to do? I love this well, stuff. I can, I can. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to talk like this until I'm going to be okay. like the NPR. Can you hear me? <laughs> so I got her. She's a, it's an, it's a oval gem, a solitaire, and then on a white, white gold band, but then the proposal itself, I'm not exactly sure, but I think I know it's going to be in the Finger Lakes in sometime in October. So we're here in upstate New York. So it's going to be down in the Finger Lakes, which are beautiful. It's going to be sometime in October-ish leaves, leaves are changing all colors. It's beautiful. And yeah, I think it just meet, might be like a nice little a little road trip that next thing you know, we pull off at some little viewpoint, pop the question. Potentially her family, my family will be nearby that we can just meet up and like, you know, grab lunch with them or grab a drink with them. And then might organize when we come back, by the time we're back in Rochester, all of our friends will be somewhere for a quick little, you know, celebration. That's it. Kind of simple, pretty straightforward, but hopefully nice. Yeah. She's going to love it. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. But of course I could talk all day and I'm sure Joel was like, don't go on her podcast. You'll never leave. <laughs> said uh, only good things to say. He reached out to me 
because you know he's like, "Hey, you going to FinCon?" I was like, "Yeah, I'm going to FinCon as long as COVID allows." Did you try for the scholarship? No. One thing I'll say that I I need to try to get better at so many emails, so many opportunities, so many so many things seem to come across my consciousness every day. I'll just say that outside opportunities that I've developed a a bad instinct to reject them. And and to be honest with you, like this sounds really bad. I don't even remember how we connected. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's the truth. Was it a DM on Twitter? I tweeted you. So that, that's actually probably one of the best ways to get my attention because I can just quickly go to your profile and be like, who's this person? Are they legit? One of the worst ways to get my attention is through email. I get so many emails of like, dear sir, I have a great opportunity to write on your blog. Will you accept? And even, you know, that one's easy, obviously, but I get so many legit ones. Like you could send me the most legit email ever. And I'd be like, no offense, Elise, I've gotten 20 of these today. Okay. What does this have to do with FinCon scholarships? All it means is that there are times when I see opportunities like that. And I'm just like, I don't have the time. I've got other stuff to do. I should have. I need to get better about prioritizing like what's real and the stuff that's just BS, like completely eliminating it from any part of my brain. Actually, what I did that you might benefit, it's one of my favorite new life hacks, is I finally stopped trying to use the different tags and like categories in Gmail. And I just set up four different separate Gmail accounts. One is for accounts that I sign up for, like Facebook and Twitter or like Nextdoor, which will proceed to like onslaught you with a bunch of emails. The other is for actual stuff I want to read, but I don't want in my face when I'm trying to do stuff. So like subscriptions, like to your incredible email list, which I like to read on my own time. Because what happens is like, if you give your email to certain places, it gets sold or given or whatever. So if you have those like junk emails, when you start getting spam, you won't even see it come through and it won't stress you out. That is so smart. I'm going to write that down. And on that note, I, that was one of the questions I was going to ask you. If you have any like productivity hacks or tech stacks that you love, by all means, I'm, I'm all ears. I mean, to some extent, to be honest with you, I, I view my budgeting as a productivity hack just because like once I do it, I feel like my budgeting is very organized. And, and once I do it, you know, once I sit down on the weekend and, and categorize everything for the week, I'm just like, boom, that, that's done. And that part of my brain is completely shut off until the next week. If that makes sense. Like it's very... Like, I feel like it's very clean and very efficient and I've got my process and it's boom, it's done. Outside of that, I just, I think I do need to get better and maybe, maybe listeners will benefit from hearing someone's like confession. This can be, you know, the productivity confessional podcast where I say, you know, I do have too many tabs open. I get too easily distracted by notifications, be them Twitter or Gmail. I mean, There are times when I'll log on to YouTube to turn on like classical music. I like to listen to classical music while I work. But the first thing that I see on YouTube is like some clip of Dave Chappelle's stand-up comedy. And so I'll watch that for eight minutes. And I'll just be like, what am I doing? I came here to write, not like listen to Dave Chappelle. So part of that just starts in my own brain. It's not because I'm scatterbrained. It's because I have succumbed to the addictive forces of social media and notifications, and Silicon Valley, and YouTube, and it's all that stuff that they talked about in The Social Dilemma. So I am aware of my problem. I'm entering my self-prescribed 12-step program, and I'm going to wean myself off of Silicon Valley's addictive teat. I love that. I am here to help you as your sponsor. Okay. Yes. In order to do my job properly, I've had to achieve a very specific productivity tech stack setup that I can share with you today if you're interested. Okay. Hear it. Yeah. Yay. Okay, cool. So like the Chrome plugin, and I think they have it for Firefox too. So the one tab extension is incredible. What will happen is you click it and it'll just fold all of those tabs into like a web page that you can see what you were looking at and then you can pluck out like the ones that you actually want to see it's so great because it's like when you have too many tabs open your brain it just like folds them all another one that will save your life is newsfeed eradicator plugin so it blocks off the youtube like videos it blocks off the linkedin the facebook the twitter feeds another app i really like it sounds like you listen to classical music when you focus i have like a lifetime subscription to brain.fm which has this like focus music that's supposed to get your brain into sort of like a creative meditative rhythm 
highly recommend that one. Really cool. And then yeah. I turn off all notifications on everything. The mm-hmm. only way you can really get to me is on my phone if you call it, but that's unlikely. Like texts are probably like the best way. And then Instagram, because like with Twitter and Instagram, people it's like a little backdoor. So I like messaging guests because I'll see it too and not be the total flake who forgot to follow up. Right, right. Thank you for those suggestions. I have heard brain.fm. You're not the first person who've mentioned that to me. I also, I just heard a dog scratching at the door. I don't know if you want to meet the dog, if dog is the podcast or not. I'll go see if the dog's still there. Okay. Yay. Oh, there's two of them. Baby, this black one here, she's our full-time pup. We got her as a foster like a year ago. And then Tess, who just hopped down, she's our current foster. So she's going to get adopted soon, but she's really sweet. We're going to miss her. Yeah, we are. We really like fostering. We really like dogs. Thank you for letting them come on the podcast. Oh my gosh. Thank you for having them. This is like a celebrity appearance. It's a big deal. This is going to get viewership out the roof. How do you find foster parents? Because I would like to foster. And so what do you recommend for fostering? What role do you want to play in the fostering? You want to be a foster? Is that what you're saying? It's all just like mysterious to me, but it sounds like something I want to do. Like, what are your secrets? How do you get involved? And then like, what do you have to do to do it? And how do you find somebody to take the pets because I would get attached all great questions so we got involved with a a local organization that is a non what do they call it a non-shelter foster organization in other words they don't have a physical building that houses dogs what our organization does is it has say 50 volunteers like us and then it has one lady who does a ton of leading and organizing on our behalves And she works with different um, shelters across the country, although predominantly in Texas, because they have a bit of a spay and neuter issue in Texas. And so we will get a van load of dogs. And I mean like a U-Haul, a big U-Haul truck style van of dogs that might have like 70 dogs in it, you know, in their own crates. Those dogs will come to a home like ours. And we will keep that dog for a couple weeks. We will kind of evaluate it on its behavior just so we can get a feel for, you know, is this an aggressive dog? Is this a dog that'd be good with kids? Is this dog shedding everywhere? Is it potty trained yet? Can it walk on a leash? Just the simple questions that a future owner would want to know. And then people will apply for that dog. After a couple weeks, we'll create an application for it with all the details about what we found out about the dog. People will apply. We will interview potential adoptees and try to say, you know, is this going to be a good fit? There's very few reasons why we wouldn't think someone's a good fit, but a great example is Tess, who was just up on my lap. She's a jumper. She's athletic. She's still a puppy. She has puppy energy. She doesn't listen that well. She might not be right for a five-year-old because she's going to run up to that five-year-old wanting to play and put her paws on the, fi- you know, so we'd say it might, might not be the best with kids. Just those kind of simple evaluations. Then, yeah, we, we find the right fit. We adopt the dog out. And then the next dog comes in, you know, roughly the next month. So we started in May of COVID, May of 2020. We had, I think, 10 dogs in 2020. And uh, we've had to slow down a little bit in 2021 for a couple couple different reasons. But I think we've still, Tess is our sixth or seventh we've had this year. So yeah, we've had a few dogs come through. Oh my gosh, good for you. That is so awesome. You're an actual real life hero. So thank you on behalf of all animals everywhere for doing Mm -hmm. that. That's really cool. If there's one takeaway for listeners today that you want them to take away that they can do in the next like 24 hours or week to make their life better in some way, whether it's wealthier, healthier, or wiser, what would you recommend that they do? I think back to something we touched on earlier about evaluating content, evaluating sources. And I think that everybody can maybe start reading with a bit more of a, a critical eye, potentially in some cases, it's, it's an interesting conundrum, I guess, because in some cases we have to read with more open minds and be willing to accept more different ideas because that's how we learn. But we also need to read with a critical eye and basically say, I need to be able to decipher what's legit from what is baloney. So that would be my advice for people to start doing in the near future is feel free to open your mind to new ideas and new sources of information. But when you find those new sources of information, be critical and ask yourself, how do I know this is true and what's true and vet your sources and and try to find what's really reliable. And it's easier said than done. I know that much, but I do think in time and dedication, it's very, very possible. 
and I, I wish would everybody would would try and, and see what they think about that. I spent nine days in August on an island camping. It's not like a rich island. This is a camping island where it rained on me for like five days. Camping in the rain isn't fun. But the point of my story is I didn't check my phone for nine mm. days. I didn't check my email. I didn't check social. I didn't check my bank accounts. I didn't check my budgeting account. I was just out camping. And it kind of makes you realize you don't need Twitter nearly as much as you think. A bunch of people out there are like, we know, Jesse, we don't use Twitter at all. But whether it's Twitter or email or Facebook or Instagram, whatever your social media or electronic vice might be, you don't need it nearly as much as you think. Go walk a dog. Go to the park. The real world is out there. It's not, it's not in here. Uh, well, where can people find you if they want to reach out and learn more? I would love to hear from people. If you want to kind of reach out to me directly, you can find me on Twitter where my username is at best interest underscore JC. Or if you want to read my work, my website is bestinterest.blog. You can email me jesse at bestinterest.blog. And if you like podcasts, tune in to the best interest podcast on most podcast apps. Nothing more that I enjoy than, than hearing from readers and listeners and folks who just want to say hi. So don't hesitate to reach out. That was so much fun. Thank you, Jesse, for coming on the show. I can't wait to hear how things go with your proposal. And I hope you have a total blast at FinCon. I wish I could join you there. What did you think of the show? Let me know in the comments below. Did you like Jesse's proposal idea? Thank you again, as always, for tuning in. We have a fantastic episode coming up for you next week that you're definitely going to want to check out. So make sure to subscribe wherever you are listening. And remember to smash that like button on YouTube if you're watching on video. Until next week, this is Elise Walsh with Invested Success signing off. I'll see you next week. Bye.